Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Stephen Wu, who's going to talk today about the challenges of AI memory systems. Steve, there's a lot of data moving through the AI chips that are being designed, and memory plays a key role in here. What sort of things do you have to keep in mind as you're working with these? Well, you really have to think a lot about uh, the whole system design, and there are a number of options for how to build your memory system. And really, the one that you choose is based on the kind of trade-offs you want to make. Really, what you're trying to do here is solve the bottlenecks, right, and keep the data moving through these chips? That's absolutely right. It turns out that for AI processing, a memory bandwidth is one of the critical limiters to performance. And so uh, what I'll talk about today is some of the different options and then the challenges as we move forward as an industry to providing even more performance. So let's drill down into this. Sure. What are we looking at here? So this chart here shows some very common memory systems that are used in AI, especially in data centers. So I wanted to go over uh, what each of these options are. They're very popular today and some of their benefits. So on the left, we see uh, one really popular option. It's called on-chip memory. So we can store uh, a lot of the model parameters and things related to our AI um, processing directly in uh, memory that's stored on the chip. So. This actually has the benefit of having the highest bandwidth and the best power efficiency. And it's a good option if you can uh, actually put enough memory onto your chip. This is typically SRAM? Yeah, it's typically SRAM. And so there's a couple of great examples out there in the industry. A lot of cell phone processors, for example, use on-chip memory. Things like Apple's Bionic processors that are used in the iPhone. And also there's other folks like GraphCore who are building an IPU, an intelligence processing unit, where they're putting a tremendous amount of SRAM directly on the chip on the order of a few hundred megabytes. So as you're working with on-chip memory, what are some of the challenges there? Yeah, one of the biggest challenges is, can you get enough capacity to store your neural network model? Now, in the case of devices that are um, at the endpoints, you can have small neural networks that can do quite a lot of good work. In the case of the data center, you, know, you often need a scalability story. So if you have a large enough network that doesn't fit on chip, you have to have a way to chain multiple chips together in order to train much larger models. So as you move that memory off chip, what changes? Well, yeah, you've got a couple of great options here. If you, uh, want to, uh, if you can't actually put your data all on chip, then there's um, some nice external DRAM solutions. The first one I'll talk about is HBM, or high bandwidth memory. What it is is it's a relatively new kind of memory where we stack a bunch of DRAM die together with another base die, and we take that stack and connect it to our processor shown right here. The way we do it is with a high density interconnect medium called an interposer. Today that interposer is made out of silicon, and it allows us to put thousands of wires uh, between the processor and the HBM uh, die stack. Now what you get here is very good bandwidth, not quite as good as the terabytes a, a, a second of memory bandwidth you can get with on-chip memory, but you, get, uh, you can get uh, much, very high bandwidths and very good densities for an external DRAM. The challenge is that uh, it involves stacking and more components, and so it's tougher to engineer, and it is more costly, but if you can tolerate it, it's a good solution. Part of this also depends upon your configuration as well, right? Because if you put an HBM stack right on top of where you're trying to, right on top of your processing element, that may be a shorter distance than trying to run a signal all the way across the chip. That's absolutely right. If you want to have the tightest form of integration, you could, in theory, stack memory directly on top of the processor, and that does lead to short connections. There are additional challenges with doing that, though, the complexity of stacking, potential yield loss, and then having to deal with a thermal environment where a processor may be very, very hot and the memory wants to be much cooler. And so you have to figure out how to tolerate the thermals. This is what we're starting to see with some of the uh, experimentation on pillars, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, the desire to integrate as tightly as possible has led to some work with pillars. Uh, and so it's a very interesting, active area of, uh, of focus for the industry. So in the real world, how is this being used? Yeah, so I've got a couple pictures here. You can see a picture of NVIDIA's Tesla V100 card, which is a very popular option for neural network training. You can see the processor right here in the middle and these four little black rectangles on the sides of the processor are the HBM devices. And you can see that it's got a little bit more complex structure before it's actually attached to the PCB, which is shown in black. 
And on the right here, you see a similar offering from AMD. It's their uh, RX uh, Vega 56, where it's got two HBM devices talking to a processor, again, with a very similar structure before it's uh, stacked onto the PCB. And HBM is, is evolving too, right? There's now HBM 2E coming out, and HBM 3 is on the horizon as well. That's right. There's always going to be a desire to go faster. And what we've seen with AI is it's really pressing the limits of each of the memory standards that's out there. Some of uh, what's driving the development uh, of these new standards are uh, the tremendous needs of applications, especially like AI. And so going forward, uh, what we expect to see is people will uh, attempt to move the signals even more quickly between HBM, and they'll try and get higher capacities. So how does this compare to GDDR, which is the rival to HBM? That's right. So um, if you look here on the right, this is um, an example of GDDR. GDDR was originally developed for the graphics market, and it's about 20 years old. Um, it's a great technology because it's packaged like a standard DRAM. It just happens to move data at very high data rates between the processor and the DRAM. Um, so here you can actually see um, are some of the devices by the major manufacturers, Micron, Samsung, and Hynix. And they look like just standard external DRAMs. Uh, what they offer is a great trade-off between bandwidth, power efficiency, but uh, ease of use, cost, and reliability by using uh, manufacturing methods that have been well understood in the industry for a few decades. So no matter what's happening here, you're going to pay for it somehow, right? Yeah, it's really a question of um, what your most important requirements are and how you trade them off against each other. Um, in the case of GDDR, one of the challenges is moving the signals at very high speeds between the processor and the DRAM. And so there, the challenge is primarily in signal integrity. Uh, with HBM, it's the complexity of assembling the entire system and the additional cost. And, but again, if you can tolerate it, um, that's, that's a great solution for you. And then with on-chip memory, um, you, know, it's, uh, you can get the highest bandwidths and best power efficiencies, but the question is if the capacity is enough for you. So let's drill down into some of the challenges here. Sounds good. So we have here is a table that kind of goes over some of the benefits of each of the technologies that I just talked about, and then what some of the challenges are moving forward. So again, in the case of on-chip memory, it offers the highest bandwidths and the best power efficiencies that you can get. Um, but the challenge is, can you get enough capacity? With HBM, you get very high bandwidth and very good power efficiency, but you have that complexity in the system engineering. And finally, in the case of GDDR, I mentioned it's a good trade-off between all the different metrics, and it's, uh, it relies on very well-understood manufacturing techniques. And so it's very friendly to what's already enabled in the industry. Now, some of the challenges going forward, I mentioned that we're going to want to be going faster with each of these technologies. AI is not showing any signs of slowing down, and in fact, the demands on memory systems are getting even tougher. And so in the case of on-chip memory, the biggest challenges moving forward are going to be, can we continue to increase the capacities at a rate that matches what the processing elements need? Remember that the chip shares both the processing elements and the storage directly in the same chip. And the question is going to be, can we find the right balance? Are we providing enough memory to keep the processing elements busy? Um, in the case of HBM, uh, the challenge will continue to be system engineering and cost. But the added challenge is to run at higher speeds in HBM, it may take some changes to how things are packaged. We may have to change some things about the materials. We may also have to change some things about um, how the wires are constructed so that we can tolerate uh, the resistances and losses and still be able to run at much higher speeds, similar to what we had seen about uh, two decades ago with external DRAMs. And then finally with GDDR, uh, GDDR today is running up to 16 gigabits per second, and so the desire is going to be to go much faster than that. If we follow the historical trend, the target will be somewhere in the range of 32 gigabits per second at the high end. It's challenging to go 16 gigabits per second and maintain good signal integrity. It's even more challenging to get to 32. Does, where does the cost uh, fit into this? Because that's obviously going to be a constraint in terms of what people are actually working with here. Yeah, so that's a really good question is that none of these things is considered in isolation on just the engineering standpoint. They're considered in terms of the cost impact. 
And so in the case of uh, GDDR, the strong desire is going to be to continue to use well-established manufacturing infrastructure and the same kinds of PCB materials because that's what's enabled it to, uh, to take such a great foothold in the market. And so some of the things that we'll be looking at are things like simple changes to the package, simple changes to the board, and some simple circuit additions uh, that don't uh, blow up the, the size of the, uh, the IOs and that don't uh, really uh, increase the power dramatically. Um, in the case of HBM, uh, the challenges will be I'm really in part trying to get the volumes high enough that you get economies of scale, and so the stacking and things like that drop down in cost. And maybe even changing materials, things like instead of having a silicon interposer, moving to something more like an organic interposer, um, and, and maybe being able to use fewer layers to help reduce the cost there. Um, and in the case of on-chip memory, uh, it's really all about finding that right balance and making sure that you've got enough memory um, at the right cost point to feed the processing engine. Most of the AI chips that have come out so far have been pretty much confined to the data center. These are starting to move out into the, the real world and the edge as we know it, which is sort of an ill-defined area. As that happens, are they all going to be at the, at the leading edge? Is that still a requirement, or do they start filtering into almost every, every uh, node that we have? Yeah, um, so uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. But what 5G offers is the ability to now process at the edge closer to where a lot of the data is being generated. What we expect to see is that processing will move out of the data center, some fraction of it will move out of the data center towards the edge and possibly even into the endpoints themselves. And so what will begin to uh, take hold there is um, you know, the, there's more cost sensitivity as you move down towards the endpoints and there'll be a strong desire to be able to implement these things in nodes that are not the leading edge. And so what, um, what we expect you know, is that it'll follow many of the other same kinds of trends we've seen in the semiconductor industry and that multiple nodes will be supported and it'll be all about kind of cost benefit trade-offs. And there's a bunch of new kinds of memory that are floating around the edges too. We have 3D cross point, we have a bunch of phase change memories, we've got uh, uh, different types of uh, approaches with MRAM and uh, FE RAM. How does that affect any of this? Yeah, this is a really great time to be in the memory industry and, and doing memory systems because there's a lot of uh, potential new entrants that we can think about using to help optimize that greater equation between performance and price. I think the challenge for any new kind of memory is to really match the reliability and the manufacturing yield as well as to hit a good cost point that allows it to work its way into the memory hierarchy. Uh, up until now, it's been very difficult for new kinds of memories to really meet all of the needs. They tend to be very good um, at a set of things, but you really have to be good at all the things in order to really find your way in. And so um, what we're seeing is a tremendous uh, interest in the industry and a lot of work going on to really try and help some of these memories make their way in. Are they any more difficult to work with than the existing memories? Um, so some of these memories, uh, for example, um, uh, things like NAND or some other, uh, you know, kind of storage class memories, uh, they sometimes can wear out over time. That's one really good example where uh, as you keep writing uh, data to it, uh, the cells themselves start to wear out. And so um, in certain use cases, if you're going to be updating your information pretty frequently, that can be a problem. And so uh, those, uh, certain, those types of memories that have kind of what's called low endurance, they don't tend to work well in those types of environments. So it's really a lot about kind of matching the upcoming use cases that we probably haven't even begun to fully understand with 5G um, against what these new memories can offer. And so now we're, we're starting to deal with a whole different dimension of things than, than what we were ever dealing with, particularly on the edge, right? That's right. I think um, what's interesting is that uh, another dimension is that what's going on in the data center versus the edge versus the endpoints. There'll be different life cycles of each of these components as well. And so things like endurance may uh, limit its use in places like the data center or the edge or the endpoints, depending on what you expect the lifetime of the devices to be. And so I've kind of talked a bit more about endurance here, but there's other metrics as well. And as engineers and system designers, we need to think about all these different metrics and really how well they fit into those use cases. One of the other things is that AI chips, particularly out on the edge, are really ill-defined. The algorithms are changing, the chip designs are changing. 
How does that affect this? Yeah, there's um, uh, in part of why you see um, some adoption of FPGAs is really because of the rapid changes we're seeing in how AI is used and what the algorithms are. And we've, uh, you know, I've talked to people who say it seems like the workloads change every month. And of course, you can't spin ASICs that quickly. And that's why FPGAs and reprogrammability make a lot of sense. And so probably in the near term, um, you know, we'll see, um, you know, kind of more of that development as, as we ourselves try and figure out what the right ideas are for AI and what to encode into hardware. And so I expect that there'll be, um, you know, both rapid iteration on chips as well as the, the continued use of FPGAs. Stephen Wu, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome.